Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. My name is Greg Caparaso. In this next series of lectures, we're going to be talking about text manipulation with regular expressions. The lectures, the content of these lectures is derived from chapters two and three of Practical Computing for Biologists. If you're looking to develop your bioinformatics computing skills, this is a great book that I recommend um, purchasing and working through. So what is text manipulation and why are we going to talk about it in this class? Well, it turns out that in bioinformatics, you spend an enormous amount of time uh, reformatting files. Um, and these are typically um, what we call text files. Um, so this might take the form of um, getting information out of one program and into another. Um, and so, for example, if the output of one program that you're using is um, a certain file format and you need to use that file as input to another program, um, that format may be different. The input format that's required may be different, um, or maybe it's a slight variation of what you're getting as output from the pr first program. Um, and so formats are often not directly compatible, unfortunately. Um, if you can learn some basic text manipulation skills, um, things like regular expressions, which we're going to learn in this lecture, um, a little bit of Python programming, which we're not going to touch on in this series of lectures, but which I do have um, four lectures on, uh, on YouTube, um, you can really empower yourself to do your own research and sort of develop your own um, informatics workflows. So rather than just being dependent on tools that already exist, learning some text file manipulation skills um, can allow you to develop your own pipelines. It also makes it so that you're not waiting on somebody else to help you move data between programs, for example. And so when I say text files, um, I want to um, just define what I mean by that. So all files that are represented in your computer, when it comes down to it at the lowest level, are linear sequences of binary numbers. In plain text files, the binary numbers encode for human readable text. Um, and so ASCII or Unicode are two common encoding schemes. In contrast, a binary file is usually uh, something that is not intended to be read by a human, but is interpreted by another program. Um, so let me um, now switch over to a terminal and show you some examples of both types of these files. Okay, so now I have a command terminal open um, and uh, in our previous lectures, I had talked about interacting with command line and some of the commands that we use. And so I just ran the first of those that I introduced, um, which is called, uh, or which is ls, um, which lists the files in a current directory. Um, and so my terminal here might look a little bit different than what um, we had in that previous lecture, but that's okay. You just sort of um, need to get used to uh, command prompts looking slightly different. And so mine is kind of a fancy command prompt here um, that includes the name of the directory that I'm currently sitting in in the prompt. And so if I were to type um, pwd, for example, you would see that I'm in users Greg Caparaso temp regex lectures. Now the um, regex lectures you can see is included in my command prompt. It's just a handy way of um, using your prompt to provide some information um, to you. Um, and so I'm going to run ls again and you can see that I've got a couple of directories here. Those are colored in blue and I've got a couple of files which are colored in gray. Um, now the first of these that I'm going to open is um, this one called poem.txt. Um, and so I'm going to use less for that. And so um, recall that less is a um, read-only file viewer. And so it lets us scan the text um, or the contents of a specific file um, without uh, uh, without being able to edit that file. And so that's what I mean when I say read only. 
Um, and so if I say um, less poem.txt, um, you can see that the Jabberwocky poem by Lewis Carroll is in this file. Um, and if I use the up and down arrows, I can scroll through here and I can see the contents of that file. Now with the less program, in order to get out of this and get my prompt back, I hit the letter Q. Um, and so that's an example, one example of a text file. Um, now you'll see I've got this other file here mysteriously named dog wearing life jacket. And so what happens if I want to see what's in that file? So let me try using less. Um, and this is going to warn me here that this may be a binary file. Do I want to see it anyway? And so I'm just going to say yes. Um, and so you can see that when I do this, um, I get a whole bunch of crazy looking content in here. Um, some of this may be things that I can recognize, like it looks like there is some text in here, um, but it also looks like there's just sort of a bunch of nonsense in here that I can't interpret. That's because a binary file is not for a human to interpret. It's intended to be interpreted by another program. Um, so in this case, it would be um, some sort of a um, text, uh, uh, or sorry, um, image viewing program. Um, a handy trick on Mac OS, which is what I'm currently running on, is that you can use the command open. And that opened on my other display. Um, but what that does is it opens that file in a program that, uh, it, that can read that type of a file. And so in this case, open called Preview, um, which is a Mac OS um, PDF and image viewer. And it opened this file called dogwearinglifejacket.jpeg. Um, and as we can see, all that um, binary looking, uh, or that nonsense looking binary that we um, saw when we opened that file, turns out to actually encode for this picture of a very cute dog wearing a life jacket. Um, and so the takeaway there is um, that there are text files which are intended for humans to read, or at least are readable by humans. Um, and there are binary files, which are typically not something that are intended to be read by humans. Now, we previously in this class talked about ASCII encoding, and this is, um, or at least historically, was a common way of representing uh, data that would, you would find in text files or characters that you would find in text files um, in binary numbers. And so this is a ASCII table which shows uh, some of the character, or shows the characters that can be represented in ASCII and their uh, binary encode, or in this case, they're decimal encodings, but you could convert those to binary numbers. Um, now, ASCII is, um, at this point, uh, pretty dated, and the reason for that is that it's almost exclusively focused on Latin characters. Um, and so this is mostly replaced these days with uh, Unicode. And so Unicode is a much more extensive encoding. And so like ASCII, it includes the Latin characters, um, some punctuation and symbols. Um, you can see there's the uppercase Latin characters. Um, we're coming up on the lowercase um, Latin characters. Um, but in addition to this, it contains um, much more, uh, 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 much more encoding. Um, and so, for example, you can see like it um, will include Greek characters um, and so on. Um, and so I'm just going to scroll through here for a minute so you can get an idea of the different types of characters that are encoded. Um, so you can see this is a much, much, much more extensive um, encoding scheme. Um, now, Unicode defines blocks of characters, um, and so, for example, you can see that um, all of these different um, scripts are included, um, and I'm just on the Wikipedia page, so you could go through um, and poke through these if you are interested. 
Um, so for example, um, like here is the uh, Cherokee Unicode block, which um, contains characters for writing the Cherokee language. Um, and so these are the different characters that are encoded in this block. These are characters that would not be accessible with ASCII. Um, and so biological data is often represented in text files. Uh, so working with text files makes it relatively straightforward, for example, to take the output from one program and use that as the input for another program. You don't need some other special program to decode that information as you would if it was a binary file. Um, so examples include um, FASTA, which is used for representing sequence data, NUIC, which is represented uh, used for representing phylogenetic trees, PDB, which is that protein data bank format, um, which is used for representing biological structures, and others. Um, I just want to point out um, quickly that Microsoft Word files um, and similar are not text files. Um, MS Word is a word processor, not a text editor. Um, and so the difference there is important. Um, so a word processor is going to include information about formatting, um, defining pages, and so on. Um, a basic text editor um, does not contain that information, and a, a very basic text file will not contain that information. There may be some information encoded in a text file that can describe formatting if you're viewing that with a compatible program, but in general, um, text files uh, do not contain formatting. Um, similarly, Excel spreadsheets are not text files, but you can export them as delimited text. And so, for example, if you save a um, spreadsheet as a TSV or a CSV, uh, meaning a tab-separated text or comma-separated text file, um, you can uh, then end up with a text file that you could use with other programs. That is very common in bioinformatics. And so, um, for example, if you have some data in a spreadsheet, you can uh, export that, say, as TSV, and then use that with a program like Chime2, for example. Um, and so delimited text, like I mentioned, is very common in bioinformatics. The lines in a file often represent records and then the values are separated by some kind of a delimiter. Um, the delimiter can be tabs, it can be spaces, it can be commas. Um, and then often these files might also contain a header line. Um, in some cases, they may also contain comment lines, um, but these are things that are gonna be specific to um, a certain tab-separated text format. And so the program that you're using to read tab-separated text has to be able to recognize header lines or comment lines. Um, delimited text in particular does not work well for hierarchical data. Um, so for example, phylogenetic tree is not easily represented in a delimited text file. Um, or if, say, a certain field might contain um, different numbers of values, that also doesn't really fit very well for a um, delimited text file. So let's take a minute now and look at some different types of text files. Okay, so I now have my command terminal back open, and I'm in that same regex lectures directory that I was in before. I'm going to call ls and I'm going to look at the files in this directory and I'm going to change into my example files directory with the cd or change directory command and then going to list what I have in there. Um, so you can see that I have uh, several directories in here and there is one text file in here and so I see I have there's a file in here called readme.txt and so the first thing I'm going to do is just take a look at that. Usually the TXT um, uh, extension indicates that this is something that is intended for a human to read directly. Um, and so um, 
I'm just gonna take a look at that with Wes. And this is just um, providing some attribution for the files that are in this directory. So nothing too exciting in there. Again, I hit Q to get out of that uh, less program. Um, so first, let's go into that FASTA directory. And so I'm going to type CD FASTA, and then I'm going to type LS. And you can see in here that I have a single file called fpexamples.fasta. FASTA is a very common file format for representing biological sequence data. And so I am going to use less to take a look at what's in this file. Um, and so what I can see in here is that this appears to be some protein sequence data. Um, these are proteins that are represented using single letter amino acid codes. Um, and because this is a FASTA file, and I know a little bit about FASTA files, I can see that there are multiple records in here. So a FASTA record starts with that greater than symbol that you see at the beginning of each of these lines, so that character right there. Um, and then it starts with a sequence identifier um, followed by a space and then some description of the sequence. And so in this case, this is my sequence identifier. And then this is a description of the sequence. And that description field in FASTA files is optional. So what's required is the greater than symbol, this followed by the sequence identifier, and then followed by a sequence record, which spans one or more lines. Um, and so this is an example of a text file, but a special type of uh, text file. And so this is a FASTA formatted text file. And so what that means is that any program that can read text files, like LESS, for example, should be able to read this file. And then if a program understands the FASTA file format, it should be able to read this file and potentially provide some additional functionality. Um, and so, for example, maybe tell you how many records are in this file or how many um, or what the length of the sequences are that are in this file. Um, now, that would be some program that, again, understands what the FASTA format is. Um, and, and how data and records are represented in the FASTA format. Um, and so let's now go back up one directory to this example files directory, and let's take a look at um, another one. So let's go into that BLAST9 directory and type ls. Um, and in this case, you can see that there's a file called blastx underscore out dot bl9. Um, and so the .bl9 suggests to me that this is um, a format that's called BLAST9. And so this is a format that you can get out of a BLAST search that is going to summarize the results of a BLAST search. Now, I just know that because I have some experience with these files. I've worked with them before. Um, but in general, you would want to, you know, if you have something like this, you might want to do a search for BL9 or try and search what like BL9 format is. So I'm going to open this with less. Um, and so what I can see here is that this is what appears to be tab separated records. And um, let's see. And um, I would think containing some comment lines. Um, it also is containing a description of the fields. Um, again, I know a little bit about this file format. Um, so what this suggests to me is these lines that start with a um, hashtag are um, comment lines. Um, again, I just know that from my own experience. Um, I see that this is, um, you know, telling me what BLAST version was used for this. Um, it's telling me something about my query. It's telling me something about the database that I searched against. Um, and it is then providing a description of the fields in the results. Um, and so you can see this actually is one really long line right here. 
Um, it's just getting wrapped around um, so that we can view it in here. Um, but I can see that I then have this um, non-comment line. And if I refer to fields, I can tell what um, each of these fields corresponds to. So this is the query ID, then this is the subject ID. So this is what it hit in the reference database. This is the percent identity of the match. This is the length of the alignment and so on. Um, now you can see there are some other queries in here. Um, so like Q2, for example, and if we come down here, we can see that Q2 had multiple hits in the database. Um, and it looks like this first hit was by far the best. So it had 100% identity with an alignment length of 376, where the next best hit had a percent identity of 42 and a four, uh, alignment length of 14. And so much lower quality, much shorter alignment. Um, and then this third one down here, Q3, um, again, um, this one had multiple hits, in this case two hits, and that first hit was the best one. Um, and so this is another example of a text file, but this is um, a uh, text file that is also tab-separated text and has some comments in it. And so Les knows how to interpret this in a very basic way, as would other text editors, um, but it doesn't really know anything about like the difference between comment lines um, versus lines containing um, uh, records of the blast results. If we wanted that, we would have to work with a program that knows something about these BL9 files. Now, because text files are so central to bioinformatics, one of the most important tools that you can have in your bioinformatics toolbox is a basic text editor. Basic text editors can be used for viewing any of these types of files that we just looked at and are also useful for developing um, source code. So if you're writing, for example, a Python script or a bash script, um, basic text editors are typically the tool that you're going to use for that. Now, there's a lot of basic text editors out there, um, and really it comes down to personal preference. So like, are there features that you are most interested in um, that might help you select between um, text editors? You may want to um, choose one based on what platform you're working on. So for example, Linux versus Mac OS versus Windows. Um, examples of some of the ones that you might want to look into are Notepad++, TextMate, Text Wrangler, Nano, which is one that we saw in the um, in my command line lecture, um, Vim and Emacs. Those tend to be um, very powerful, but a little bit more complex to use. Um, Atom is a great one that is built by the GitHub group, and VS Code is a really nice one that is gaining in popularity. Um, for this lecture, when we start doing some regular expression work, I'm going to use VS Code. I recommend that if you're going to follow along with these lectures, that you use VS Code as well. You can download that for free. Just Google VS Code and you will find the relevant download links. Now, I also want to point out that, um, for example, Microsoft Word is not a basic text editor. It's a word processor, and so it does um, a lot of additional things on top of a text editor, um, mostly focused on um, formatting of documents and pages. Um, and so you are not going to want to choose Microsoft Word or a similar word processor um, as your text editor. There's some specific features that are convenient to have in a text editor that you'll be using for working with plain text files. These include things like showing line numbers. That's useful if you are trying to, say, debug some code or if you're trying to um, compare content that you might have in your file with what somebody else has. Um, showing invisible characters um, and so that is things like white spaces versus tabs and i'll show an example of this in a few minutes um, but many programs treat spaces and tabs differently and so it's useful to be able to see sometimes where space characters are and where tab characters are in your file um, and it's also handy if your um, text editor can support regular expressions in search or place 
And so regular expressions are something that we're going to be spending um, a lot of time with over the uh, next couple of lectures here. Um, and so regular expressions at their core are a um, language that is used for search replace. And so they provide functionality beyond just a simple search replace that turns out to be very useful when you're doing bioinformatics or any other kind of data science. Regular expressions are very widely used, but unfortunately they're not fully standardized. And so the program that you're working with, um, whether that's VS Code, whether it's something like Google Sheets, whether it's a terminal-based program like GREP or a programming language like Python or some other text editor like Text Wrangler or JEdit, they're going to have their own variations on the regular expression language. Um, and so for the most part, they will work similarly to one another. But there's going to be some small differences that you'll have to get used to. So really, the best thing that you can do when you're learning regular expressions is choose your weapon. Um, so for example, if it's going to be VS Code, um, choose VS Code and stick with it. And then that way, um, you shouldn't have to run into differences across languages of regular expressions um, and deal with those. And instead, you can just get pretty efficient with one of them. Good way to figure this out is just Google for the tool that you're using and regular expression, and that'll usually turn up some sort of a helpful reference. So some of the kinds of things that we might want to do with um, uh, with regular expressions, and specifically, um, you know, maybe if we're reformatting text to go from one program to another. Um, is sort of basic changes like replacing commas with tabs in a delimited text file. Um, that's you know pretty straightforward. You might be able to pull that off with a basic search replace, but a lot of the things that you might need to do are too complex for a basic search replace. That might be because the search term is too generic and so it matches many things in a file when you really are just looking for one specific thing. Um, or the input is too varied to match with a simple search term. Um, and so, for example, let's say you're trying to match any latitude and longitude. Uh, it's hard to capture that with a simple search term, but that's the kind of thing that a regular expression is great for. And we're going to work with that specific example. Um, it also lets you do things like reorder columns if needed um, in a delimited text file. Um, it allows you to um, derive, say if you're working in a delimited text file, derive new columns from existing columns and so moving data from one entry to another. And of course these are things that you probably could do manually. But manual manipulation of files, especially when they get big, and we're going to give you some big files to work with, can be tedious, it's error prone, and really it's just a huge waste of time. Um, if you, you know, spend a lot of time reformatting something that contains thousands of lines in it, uh, say a tab separated text file um, containing sample metadata, um, for thousands of samples, first of all, that is going to take you, you know, depending on what you need to do, it's going to take you a day or days. You're probably going to make some errors along the way. And these tools, like regular expressions, aren't really that hard to learn. And so you could probably learn this in the amount of time that it would take you to do a man uh, manual manipulation of a very large file. And then that way, if you have to do it again in the future, it'll be much quicker that second time. Um, so again, regular expressions are a more powerful approach for doing search replace. Um, you can do sort of your basic search replace functionality very easily, but they employ something called wildcards to match varied patterns. Um, so for example, things like all digits, but where you don't know exactly what digits you're expecting. So that latitude longitude example again. Um, and then it allows you to capture parts of a search term and use it in a replace term. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, so now I'm going to do a little demo of some of the functionality that you can um, access using regular expressions. 
And I'm gonna do this, like I said before, using VS Code. And so I've installed VS Code and opened it. And I'm gonna open the directory of example files that we were looking at earlier in the lecture. Um, so we'll just give that a second to open. And I am going to try to zoom in a little bit here just to make it easier for you to follow along. Okay, so the first um, example that I am going to look at is um, this file which contains one taxon name, taxon name, as a genus and species. And as you probably know, um, we, when representing species names, we often, often want to um, represent the genus with just a single character, its first character, followed by a period, and then the species name. And so if I want to access that functionality in VS Code, I can hit um, Command or Control F, depending on whether you are on Mac OS or Windows. Um, you could also uh, access that um, in the edit menu and then selecting find. Now you don't want to use find in files um, because that would search all of the files that are currently accessible and so that would be everything under example files. Similarly this magnifying glass icon would search all of these files. And so we're gonna do a find in a specific file. And so again, um, I would do that by going to edit, find, or by hitting command or control F, depending on your operating system. Okay, so imagine that I wanted to do that search that I just described, and I'm gonna see if I can zoom out a little bit just um, to find, okay, so I'm gonna try that. Um, and so, if I wanted to do that here, um, I could do something like this. Um, so find Galma, I can hit that down arrow, and I can say replace that with a dot. Um, and then I'm just gonna click this button over here on the right, which says replace all. And you can see that it did that in this file. Um, so easy enough, and that is how you would do that if you have a single example. Um, I'm just going to undo that so that I don't modify this file. And I'm going to move on to this other file called taxalist2. And you can see that since my find box is still up and it's highlighting the term that I have in there, you can see where this problem is going to come in. Um, and so if I were to try and do this search now, so I hit replace all, you can see a couple things that's going on. First of all, that term that we provided is not specific enough. Um, and so there are some uh, genus species names that do not match to that. And so, for example, um, these two on the bottom, we have no changes. And then there are also some spurious matches. Um, and so these first two contain that text, G-A-L-M-A, -A, but it's not exactly where we were looking for. And so this is a case where, you know, if we wanted to do this and potentially do this across thousands of records, um, this search replace would not um, work as is. So let's come back to how we would do that in just a minute. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to close that find. I'm gonna close this, I'm gonna close this. And I'm going to open up this lat long example. Um, and so now here's a list of latitudes and longitudes with latitudes on one line and then a longitude on the following line. Um, now imagine that I wanted to um, do something like find um, all of the um, N's and W's and S's and E's in this file and just strip them out, get rid of them. So I could do that with four search terms. So I could search for N's and replace them with nothing. I then search for W's and replace them with nothing. And so, um, you know, for example, if I do this, I can um, 
do that replace and then I can do this replace and then I can do this replace and then I can do that replace um, that works um, I'm just undoing to get back to my original um, it works it's a little bit clunky um, in part it works because there's only four different bits of text that we're trying to match here um, if you think back to that previous example that probably wouldn't have worked with the genus names if we just tried to um, enumerate all of the different um, all of the different options and go through those and do that search replace It'd be very tedious so with regular expressions there is a concept called wildcards where you can provide um, certain patterns that will match different types of characters and so the first wild card that i'm going to show you is slash w um, and this is a wild card that matches letters and di and digits um, and now you'll notice um, I just said this matches letters and digits. There's a lot of let letters and digits in this file, but none of them were highlighted. Um, that is because we have to tell VS Code that we want to search using regular expressions. And the way we do that is by clicking this little dot star icon, and that says use regular expressions. Why it's a dot star, we will come back to later. It'll be um, a lot more clear once you start to familiarize yourself with this language. Um, and so now um, you can see if I do this slash W and I replace that with nothing, I'm going to click that. And you can see that that is going to match and replace all of the letters and digits in this file. Now that is a little bit... Um, uh, uh, matches a little bit too much. So again, it's not exactly what I want. And so what I would do in this case, if this was something that I was trying to do, is I would look for look at this text that I have and I would try and figure out, okay, what is unique about this? Like how would I just match those letter characters? And what I could notice is that every time I have one of those, it's preceded by a double quote. And so if I change my search term to put a double quote in there, then you see that it is matching specifically what I'm looking for. Um, now, I don't want to remove that double quote. All I wanted to do was remove the letters and numbers. And so what I would do here simply is I would just match every, every double quote slash W and just replace it with the double quote. And so if I do that, now that gets me the replace that I was looking for. Um, and so this is um, a useful illustration here of what you can have, what types of um, patterns you can match with regular expressions. And so in addition to wildcards, you can also use uh, typical text characters that you would match in a simple regular expression. Uh, or sorry, in a simple find replace and not a regular expression. And so you can mix very specific characters that you're looking for with wild cards that match characters very generically. Okay, so before we get back to our taxa list, let's learn about a few other, th uh, a few other features of regular expressions that'll be helpful in that example. And so to do that, I'm going to open up this ordinals directory and open this file called one.txt. Now, if I wanted to do a search in here that matched each of the numbers here, um, but not the characters that follow that, um, and then say modify how this was being presented. And so like this file looks like it's presenting an order of something. So it's saying something fifth, then third, then second, then fourth, then first. So imagine that these are describing, say, like some position numbers, and I want to just capture those numbers. Um, th this is a very cool feature of regular expressions um, called uh, capture or capture groups. 
And so what we would do here, so you would imagine, uh, you can imagine, like if I just do that slash W, that's going to match everything in this file. Um, now, if I want to match each of these characters individually, um, I can also do that by putting three of these slash W's next to each other. And that's that what this pattern is now saying is match a digit or a letter followed by a digit or a letter followed by a digit or a letter. And so just for example, um, if I were to um, say 1A, that's not going to match here because it is not matching this exact pattern of three consecutive digits or letters. Similarly, if I do 1AB, that is not going to match. Um, on the other hand, if I had gone with that initial pattern, that would match everything. So let me just delete those last two lines um, and go back to this pattern. And so now I'm going to show you this idea called capture groups. Um, and so if I were to take parentheses and put them around that first character that I'm going that I want to match, what that does is it makes that first character that's matched accessible for me to use in my replace term. Um, and so let's say I wanted to replace this with something that says position, colon, space, and then I want that digit. What I can do since I captured that is I can put in a dollar sign one and that is a regular expression syntax that says, give me the first character that I captured at this spot in my replace term. And so if I now hit replace all, you can see that it's gonna replace each one of those with position, colon, space, and then that digit that was captured. And so that is really powerful. And that is where you really start getting into some of the very useful functionality of regular expressions. Now, what this is an important point um, to mention again, that there are differences between regular expression languages and different programs. If you're following along with the text in Practical Computing for Biologists, Chapter 2, this dollar sign character um, would actually be a slash one. Um, in the regular expression language that the authors use um, to use in the examples in their book, the um, that captured term is represented with a slash one or slash two. Um, where in the regular expression language that we're using, which is the one built into VS code, it's a dollar sign. Um, and so that's just a difference between the text and the, um, the text and what we're doing in this lecture. Okay, so I am going to undo that again, just so I've got my original file there still, close my find. And now I want us to go back to our taxa list. Um, and so here um, we um, need to use one additional feature here of regular expressions to uh, derive a search replace that will replace all of these genus names with their first character followed by a period. Um, and so because we want to use that first character you can guess that we probably are going to want to use a capture group there. Um, but this is um, a very generic capture here. Um, what this is doing is, again, just matching a single letter or digit. And so you can see that this matched 77 times in this file. So that must be the number of characters that are showing up in this file, or letters and digits that are showing up in this file. Um, and so what we want to do next is we want to match some other number of um, some other number of letters, but that number differs. And so we use what's known as a quantifier. 
in a regular expression. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say slash W. That, of course, matches just one character. But if we put this plus after it, what that does is that matches um, one or more of that specified character type. And so in this case, one or more digits. And so what we would um, do here, we're going to get rid of that. Um, and so if you then imagine, we can do dollar sign one dot, uh, and then do um, use that as our replacement term. Um, that should grab that first character, and um, we will just run this, see what happens. And we can see that our search term was a little too generic here. So we, instead of just matching the genus name, we're matching the genus name and the species name. And so I'm going to undo that. And the way that I would handle this is I would put a space. And then remember that we do actually want to use that genus name as well. And so I'm going to do slash W plus, but I'm going to put that in a capture group this time. And so what that's going to do is it's going to match the genus name and it's going to capture it. And so if I modify my replace term here to be dollar one dot and then dollar two, what that's going to do is it's going to take the first capture, print that, follow it by a period and a space, and then my second capture. And so if I run that, you can see that that now finally achieves that find replace that I was looking for. So I'm going to undo again to get back to my original file. And I'm just going to show you a couple of the other things that you can do here um, now that we've captured the two of these. So in this case, I'm using each of the captured groups one time, um, but you can you can get more elaborate than that. And so, for example, you could um, do something like, let's say you, um, let's say we just want to capture, um, let's capture the full genus name as well. Um, and so what I could then do is I could do something and, uh, for example, say like dollar two, dollar three, space, and then dollar one underscore dollar three. And so take a minute, look at that and see if you can imagine what that is going to do. I'll then run this. And we can see that like what I did was basically just append the genus initial, so the first letter, underscore species name, to the end of each of these lines. And so I did that by capturing the first letter of the genus, then the rest of the genus, and then the species name. And so then I have those in these variables, $1, $2, and $3, and I can do whatever I want with those. Um, if I undo that, um, you can see like there's no requirements about the order here, so I can make these um, pretty, you know, this will be very confusing, but um, I can do something like this. So just reverse the order there not giving us anything very useful, of course, um, but just to show you, you can repeat things. Whoops, um, let me undo that. Um, you know, if we repeat things, there's no real limits to like how you can use those replaced uh, or those captured groups. Um, okay, so now one last thing I wanna show you in this lecture um, is imagine now um, that we need to capture one of those, or we need to um, include one of those special characters that we've been using in our search term. And so, for example, the text that I have here includes some text with parentheses in it. And remember that the parentheses was a special character that was used to define our capture groups. So, if the parenthesis is representing um, a capture group, how could I use that um, in my search term? 
Um, and so the way that you do that is something called escaping characters. Um, and so, for example, let's say we wanted to do something like um, match the full genus name followed by the full species name. And let's capture each one of those. Followed by this text that's inside the parentheses. Um, and so I can't match the parentheses here because that would define the beginning of a capture group. But what I can do is I can put a backslash before that parenthesis. And what that does is it tells the regular expression language, I want to literally match a parenthesis, an open parenthesis in this case. I don't want to use that as a capture group. Um, now, if I do want to capture the text that's in there, I could do the same as before. So I've got that capture group. So I've got my parenthesis slash backslash w plus close parenthesis and now let's say i want to match that closing parenthesis i would do backslash closing parenthesis and what that would then let me do let's just do something with this so we can see what i've got here um, so i'm just going to basically move the fields around with this search term so I'm now putting what was previously in parentheses at the beginning of the line followed by a colon. Um, and I am uh, then putting the genus and species names. Um, and so that shows how you would match a character that is a special character in the regular expression language. Okay, so we're going to wrap up there for this lecture. Um, and in the next lecture, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into regular expressions and explore um, some other uh, character sets. And so um, we looked at this special term slash W, which is uh, letters and numbers. We're going to look at some other um, uh, some other terms like that and then um, just generally sort of go deeper into um, what you can do with regular expressions. Okay, see you next time.